The scale of the First World War was so large that it was often difficult to gauge. Now, I talk a lot about the numbers of the dead, the wounded, even the refugees. But today, I'm going to throw some other numbers at you to help get some more perspective. Not numbers of people, numbers of things. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War special episode of The Great War in Numbers. The destructive power of the technologies used in the First World War was devastating like never before in history, and this power increased exponentially as the war went on. In no area was this more obvious than in the use of artillery. Artillery was comparatively rudimentary at the beginning of the war, but the continued development of gun design, ranging technology, counter barrages, tactical deployment, and the innovations in artillery design all contributed to increase the deadly efficiency of artillery. But what really increased the body count was the enormous increase in the sheer amount of artillery. For example, at Champagne and Artois in 1915, the French expended 8 million shells over two months along a 50 kilometer front. That's about 30 miles. Over a similar time span, a similar two month time span, two years later at Chemin des Dames, the French poured 19 million shells into a 40 kilometer front, only 25 miles. The Battle of Verdun, however, has become famous, or infamous, for the heavy use of artillery. The German plan was to shell the French into oblivion, and to prepare for that, the German army amassed enough ammunition to fire two million shells from 1,200 guns in only six days, and a further two million shells in the ensuing 12 days. Now this required as you might imagine, a huge amount of preparation. In the lead up to battle, over 30 trains a day were scheduled to offload shells behind the German lines. The battle began on February 21st, 1916, with roughly one million shells being fired into the French lines during just a 10 hour bombardment. As the battle raged on, artillery bombardment became the norm and became increasingly intense. Between August 11th and August 20th, so just 10 days, the French army fired three million shells into an area only four kilometers by half a kilometer, so just 2.5 miles by just over 500 yards, wreaking havoc on the German operations and supply lines. By the time the battle ended, it is estimated that as many as 65 million shells were used by the French and German armies, and that 75% of the over 700,000 casualties were caused by artillery fire. Of course, staggering numbers are not just limited to weaponry. With millions of soldiers in the field, you also had logistics and supply problems like none ever seen before. By 1915, the Western Front stretched roughly a thousand kilometers, like 600 miles, from the Swiss border to the North Sea. Millions of men held both sides of the line in trench networks, fortifications, dugouts, fortresses, redoubts, and well, holes in the ground, right? In addition to providing shells and armaments for soldiers along the Western Front, which was no small feat, the logistical branch of each army had to consider the supply of everyday necessities and services for all these men in what were, in reality, mobile towns and even mobile cities all along the line. Now here's an example. In 1917, the Canadian Corps was holding a six kilometer portion of the Western Front before the Battle of Arras. That's it, just six kilometers, like four miles. But this single corps holding that fraction of the front included 97,184 Canadians, along with a British division in reserve. With support staff and services, a total of 170,000 men were engaged there, right? To put this in context, if that group was in Canada in 1917, it would have been the third largest city in Canada after Montreal and Toronto. In addition to supplying ammunition for 100,000 soldiers and 983 artillery pieces, systems for food, water, transport, medical services, communications, engineering, entertainment, training grounds, billets, and general infrastructure had to be developed and maintained. Behind the trench networks, this operations area stretched for over 10 kilometers. Now, to supply these operations and to facilitate transport, engineers built or improved 50 kilometers, 30 miles, of roads and maintained it on a daily basis as the roads were constantly being battered down. 
Because of the heavy traffic and the constant bombardment, much of the roads were built up with wood, forming double-lane plank roadways to support supply and rear assembly areas. The Canadian Corps Light Railway built and maintained a 20-kilometer mile-long tramway system that brought shells forward by night and was designed to transport thousands of wounded men to clearing stations once the battle began. Now, these narrow-gauge rail lines ran into some of the 13 subways that were dug 8 meters, 26 feet, underground into the chalk bedrock along the front line. Totaling 12 kilometers in length, the parallel subways that led right up to no man's land were to be used for troop movements before the battle. They were outfitted with telephone communications. Most had electrical lighting, and the longest subway had a water main that helped bring some of the 600,000 gallons or 2.3 million liters of water that was needed at the front every day for the soldiers and the 50,000 horses and mules used by the Corps. The water system included 21 pumping stations and over 70 kilometers of pipeline. In order to fulfill an ever-increasing need for wood for these roads, railways, as well as duck boards and tunnel supports, Forestry companies erected mobile sawmills behind the Canadian lines, supplying over 30,000 meters, 100,000 feet, of rough planking every week. Communication systems were built both above ground and below, with 1,800 kilometers of telephone wire being laid in tunnels and across the trench system used by that Canadian Corps. Most of this infrastructure was built over a six-month period. Once the Battle of Arras forced the German line back, each headquarters and each unit attached to the Canadian Corps had to reorganize and move operations forward. The logistical process of relocating hospitals, headquarters, stores, supply depots, kitchens, batteries, and the like, and building the requisite infrastructure as new lines were established was time-consuming and labor-intensive. But was also crucial to military operations. I want you to bear in mind that all of this, all I've just said over the last two or three minutes, was to supply a little more than half of 1% of the trench lines on one side. Supply on the German side, well, on any side, was just as complicated. The food requirement alone was pretty mind-blowing. I'm gonna give you the next few numbers in pounds, right? Two pounds is a bit less than a kilo, just for your reference. In the First World War, Holger H. Herwig notes that in one month, a German unit of 35,000 men would consume a million pounds of meat, 600,000 loaves of bread, 242,000 pounds of canned meat, 121,000 pounds of marmalade, and 73,000 pounds of coffee. The horses of that same unit would need 7 million pounds of oats and over 4 million pounds of hay. Herwig also notes that the 18th Army Corps reported that in one month, Corps butchers had slaughtered 1,320 cows, 1,100 hogs, and 4,158 sheep to meet the food requirements of the men. So, extrapolated from them to the entire German army, in one week, the army needed 60 million pounds of bread, 131 million pounds of potatoes, and over 17 million pounds of meat. I thought you guys might like a quick look at a small variety of the staggering numbers that aren't just related to the killing of millions of young men. Well, I lie. All of the numbers are related to the killing of millions of young men. And the bigger the numbers, the greater the killing. Thanks a lot to Ryan Gallant, who had the idea for this episode and did most of the research for us. Uh, if you like that idea, let us know in the comments, and we'll see if we can come up with some more numbers for World War I. For our ranking of the most stupid moves of the first year of the war, you can click right here to see that. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.